How many people have put their faith in Jesus and presumed that God will not use them because of their failures? They have this idea that because they're not morally perfect, God cannot use them. They commit sin and therefore God cannot or will not use them in any significant way. But I need to tell you, this is not true. God works through flawed people. Even the best, the most successful believers are flawed. The story of Esther illustrates how God uses believers who've experienced moral failure. Most Christians only know a part of Esther's story. That is her unexpected rise to become queen and then her courageous acts to save her people from destruction. But Esther's story has another side to it, a side that is often untold. But before I get to that other side of Esther's story, let me debunk this idea that God cannot or will not use believers who are flawed, that is, not morally perfect. Here's the truth. No believer, let me say no believer, is without sin. We all make mistakes. Even the greatest Christian of the New Testament the Apostle Paul had issues with sin. The man struggled from time to time mightily with sin. He writes about this struggle in the seventh chapter of his letter to the Roman church. He gives this long explanation and then he concludes his discussion with the following. So I find it to be a law, that is how something works. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, Evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Wow, all of us can identify with those words. Like Paul, we find ourselves from time to time wanting to do what is right, but instead we do what is wrong. And here we see one of the greatest Christ followers to ever walk planet earth, and he's wrestling with sin. And you and I, as I've said, can identify with every word that he writes. Yet, in spite of Paul's daily battle with sin, if you will, and at times not coming through, God still used Paul in a mighty way. So here's the question I raise to you. How can you say that God cannot or will not use you because you struggle with sin? If God required moral perfection in people he works through, then no one would ever be used of God. Now, it is a fact that because of the indwelling Holy Spirit, Christ followers have been set free from the slavery of sin. Paul writes about this in another chapter before he gets to that seventh chapter, back in chapter six to the letter to the Roman church. This is what he says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What Paul is telling us, he's telling us that the power of sin has been broken in our bodies. But that is not saying that you and I, as Christ followers, can never sin again. The truth is, we live in unredeemed bodies that are subject to that downward pull of sin. We do have the ability of the Holy Spirit, that upward pull of God's Spirit indwelling us, to say no to the flesh, but there are times we don't allow that to work in our life and we sin, we make mistakes. But you need to keep in mind that as a Christ follower, because you being indwelt by God's spirit, there is that upward pull that keeps you from succumbing to the downward pull of the law of sin and death. Paul writes like this in Romans 8, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now again, 
Paul keeps using this word law. In this context, it just simply means how something works. A way to explain this is, well, let's use what we, in a modern context, something that Paul would not have understood, but I think it, it will be helpful for you and me, is to use the law of aerodynamics, which is just simply how air moves around things. The law of gravity, which we're all familiar with, will pull us all to the ground. It keeps us grounded, if you will, and we can feel that downward pull. But there is another law, and it's called the law of aerodynamics, which allows an airplane, if you will, to escape the law of gravity. As an airplane picks up speed, air is moving over and under the wings of that plane, causing lift. And that one law, then, is overcome by another law. That is, the law of aerodynamics overcomes the law of gravity, which allows the plane to lift off the ground. In the same way, that is true of you and me as followers of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. That is the law of the spirit of life. It is a greater law, and it can allow you and me to walk free from that downward pull, if you will, the law of sin and death. But here is something very important. That does not mean that just because you and I, as Christ followers, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we are going to achieve moral perfection in this life. Nor does it mean that God is expecting moral perfection from each one of us, that is, those of us who are indwelt by His Spirit. And we've seen already that Paul struggled with sin. He saw something working in his body, and when he wanted to do what was right, there were times he simply did not do that. He did what was wrong, and yet God still worked in a powerful way through this man. As we've seen through Paul's life, God does indeed work through flawed people. He uses flawed believers to accomplish his works on earth. Again, even the most useful, successful believers are flawed. Now let's go to the story of Esther, particularly to that part of the story that is left untold. Esther was part of the remnant of the Jews who chose not to return to Israel when King Cyrus decreed that if any Jew wanted to return to his homeland, he could. Well, many Jews decided not to return, they stayed in Babylon, and Esther was a part of that group. And she is living under the rule of King Ahasuerus. And her story begins when the king is seeking a new queen. And Esther is going to find herself gathered up in a company of other beautiful young virgins and placed in the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch. Reading in chapter 2, here's what we read. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under the custody of Haggai the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women." So we find Esther placed in the custody of Haggai, where she is going to spend the next 12 months under his supervision, his care. We read again in Esther 2. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go in to King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women. What is going on here? What, what is this saying? Well, let me give you the facts. Haggai was a eunuch, that is, he was a man who had been castrated. And Esther was a virgin who had to wait 12 months before she was eligible to go in to the king. Now, these facts are not incidental, nor are they accidental. That year-long trial period was to determine with certainty that Esther was a virgin. And Haggai, who was to take care of her during that time, she was under his care and his supervision. He was no threat to take that virginity, for he was a eunuch. And then the biblical text is very, very clear concerning what happens next. 
regarding Esther. She would spend a night with the king. Please don't miss this fact. She is going to spend the night with the king. Let me read again in Esther 2. When the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of, and this is a very difficult name, Sheheshgaz, however, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines, that is, this second harem. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. So, following the night with the king, Esther is now no longer a virgin. She is being transferred to a second harem that is made up of the king's concubines. These are women that are no longer virgins. And here is what is happening. And here is what you and I, as the reader, need to be aware of. Esther is essentially in a sexual tryout to be queen. We are never told, by the way, that she resisted the circumstance or that she thought sexual relations with a pagan king might be wrong in the eyes of God. Now, to be certain, Esther was without power. She could have refused, and the consequences, more than likely, of that refusal would have been dire. They really would have been serious. But we never read that she refused. In fact, she spent the night with the king... She was not a virgin when she woke up the next morning, and later she would be chosen to be queen because the king was delighted in her. Here's what you need to understand. Esther was not a paragon, or Esther was not a role model of spiritual virtue for this part of her story. She was not like Daniel and his friends who were willing to face death under circumstances that were beyond their control. They were unwilling to compromise their purity and their faith. And Esther did not do this in this certain situation. She did what was required of her. She spent the night with the king. But later when Esther was queen, she would then put her life at risk to save her people. She could have easily have been killed at this moment in her life, but she chose to put her life on the line because she saw her people were about to be wiped out. She was used by God in d- despite, if you will, of her failures. Esther, she was flawed just like you and me, but God still worked through her to save a generation of Jewish people who were about to be annihilated. Now, my main point is not to say that followers of Jesus can sin with impunity. I am not saying in any way that sin is irrelevant. The Bible is not saying that at all. I am not in any way trying to make excuses for our sin. That's not the point either. We've already discovered earlier that because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is the law of the spirit of life working in us, and we can rise above the law of sin and death. But the reality of is, is in that is in this life, you and I are never going to be morally perfect, but how we conduct our lives is very important. A person who says that they're a follower of Jesus and yet routinely chooses and commits sin in every possible way is probably not a believer. They are a pretender. But what I am saying is that no Christ follower is morally perfect in this life. As a follower of Jesus, we all make mistakes. But this does not mean that God can never work through us. This does not mean that God cannot nor will not use us in any significant way. God has always worked through flawed people, people who are faithful to God but are not in any way morally perfect. Even the best, the most successful believers are flawed.
Hey, listen, I hope this has been helpful. I know it has been for me, and I, I've used this so often in my life because just like you, I make mistakes, and I make them daily. And there are times I can feel the enemy lying to me and saying, well, you've really messed up this time. God is never going to use you. But I know that that is simply not true. I know that by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, my life is a new creation. And it means that I can rise above the law of sin and death. But there are times when I don't, just like you. And there are times when we fall flat on our faces. But that does not mean that God cannot or will not ever use us. It does not mean that God is expecting moral perfection from us. Remember, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Even the best, the most successful believers are flawed. Well, again, I hope this has been very helpful. And if it has, would you take just a moment to hit that like button? And by the way, if you've not yet subscribed to this channel, I would love for you to do so. Just hit that subscription button. I post every week new videos coming out weekly. And I would love for you to come along as we explore the truth of what God says in His Word, the Bible. And again, thanks for being a part of this. And as always... God's very best to you.